All right, having in the last video looked at the foundations of Hartree-Fock theory and seen the nature of the integrals appearing in individual Fock matrix elements, now let's take a look at the approximations that can be employed to simplify the construction of the Fock matrix, hopefully without uh, removing its utility for the uh, computation of molecular orbitals and their use in chemical analysis. I showed this somewhat imposing slide in the last lecture, and this is just to recall to your mind that the steps in the Hartree-Fock procedure involve filling up the secular determinantal matrix, and so that is computing all the F and S terms appearing in the matrix, where each one of those terms, these are Fock matrix elements, these are overlap matrix elements, and it's the Fock matrix elements that in some sense involve the most work in the calculation, there are one electron integrals for kinetic energy and for nuclear attraction, and then there are these two electron integrals describing the repulsion between uh, one electron and all of its possible partners within the molecule. And because the electron repulsion itself depends on the occupied molecular orbitals, and that's what the density matrix provides a measure of, given occupied orbitals, how important are individual basis functions in those occupied orbitals? That's what the density matrix measures. We need to start with a guess density matrix, and then we follow a so-called self-consistent field approach to converging the density matrix with respect to uh, the coefficients in the molecular orbitals, and we would do that for each geometry, and we might optimize the molecular geometry. All right, so uh, that's just a recap of what we saw last time. Let me uh, draw up these integrals a little bit bigger here, and we've got the density matrix, and remember these coefficients are what we're using to make molecular orbitals. That's why we want these coefficients. And what are the occupied orbitals, by the way? Well, in an Aufbau sort of approach, you would nominally be putting two electrons in all of your orbitals from lowest energy to highest energy. So because you're getting capital N different energies, if you have m electrons, where m is uh, less than uh, twice n, you will fill the first m over 2 orbitals as you uh, just aufbau them up, and those are the occupied orbitals you run over here to construct the density matrix. So most semi-empirical theories began by uh, restricting themselves to a region of the periodic table that would be a bit more convenient, and so in particular we're only going to do first and second row atoms, and by first and second row here, I'm not counting hydrogen and helium as the first row. That's a little unconventional. Typically, if a theorist says first row, they mean running from lithium to neon. And the second row is the row immediately below. And uh, the convenience there is that from a valence standpoint, those elements only use S and P type orbitals in their bonding. We're also going to consider a minimal basis set. That is, when I consider how many basis functions I'll use, I'll use the minimum number to describe the S and P core and valence orbitals of the atoms. And I'll say more actually about core in a moment, because in fact most semi-empirical theories ignore core orbitals. But we'll get to that temporarily. Uh, now, a, a feature in the in any Hartree-Fock calculation, I should say a feature, but the process, if you will, so step one, what shall I choose for a basis set? That was step one, remember, choose a basis set. Uh, and at this stage, our goal is to simplify the construction of the Fock matrix by not necessarily analytically computing the values of integrals, but instead coming up with values for those integrals that involve less computational work. And so what are the integrals? Well, they're overlap integrals. They appear in the determinant itself. What shall I do about them? And then individual Fock matrix elements. Will I adopt some particular approach for the one electron integrals, of which there are two kinds? And uh, number four here, what about the electron repulsion integrals? Okay, so in terms of answering these questions, as I just mentioned, semi-empirical models adopt a minimal basis set. Moreover, uh, the AO basis functions which cover only the valence orbitals, so that's what minimal means. Of course, if I did go lower in the periodic table to where D and or F orbitals are occupied, I'm going to need those functions, but I'll only have one function per orbital. 
So there will be one S function for a given S function. There will be three P functions, X, Y, and Z, for a given uh, uh, quantum number level, and 5D and 7F. And those basis functions I'm going to use will be Slater orbitals. So if I ever need to do a calculation, uh, when I plug into that integral, I'll use a true Slater orbital. This is the form of a Slater orbital. It looks a little imposing, but it's pretty straightforward. It has a normalization factor. It's got a radial factor. It has a spherical harmonic, which just tells you if it's S, P, D, and so on. And finally, it's got a, an exponential uh, kill factor, if you want, if you'd like to call it that, which drops off as e to the minus some factor times r. Okay, well, so generally, the choice that's made for the overlap integrals in semi-empirical theory is... Although it's not very hard, in fact, to compute the overlap between two Slater-type orbitals located at different positions in space, uh, we're only going to do that occasionally. So it, it can be done, and it's in another lecture we'll see when you might want to do that. But in general, uh, and I guess I'll say that the reason it is done is occasionally to assist in computing Fock matrix elements. So remember, an overlap matrix element gives you an idea about how close two functions are. When the overlap matrix element approaches 1, you know that these functions are almost right on top of each other. It goes to 0 as they're quite far away. And so some Fock matrix elements, naturally, so uh, two electron integrals, for instance, they're a measure of how close are or far away are electrons. They won't repel each other much if they're far away. So sometimes you'd like to know about that distance, if you will, by computing an overlap. However, in order to simplify the, the Hartree-Fock procedure, most semi-empirical theories adopt a simplification that the overlap matrix is taken to be the unit matrix. That is, the mu nu element of S is taken to be 1 for diagonal terms and 0 for all other terms. So that when I go back to my secular determinant, I'll flip back a few slides here, here we go, notice that all these values of S will be 0 except along the diagonal where there'll be 1. And so you see, if you think about expanding this determinant, you'll get an nth order polynomial in E, but it's going to be missing a lot of lower powers of E because you've made uh, you've multiplied them by zero everywhere else in the determinantal equation. All right, so that was the overlap matrix integral. Now, what about the Fock matrix integrals? Well, it's very helpful in thinking about semi-empirical approximations to recognize that there are two kinds of uh, Fock matrix elements. There are elements where, actually there's three kinds, I guess I'll call out. So there are so-called diagonal elements. That is, where mu is equal to nu. So you are computing an element on the diagonal of the secular determinant. And so that's the diagonal. There is also a missing r in this word matrix here. So of course that should be matrix. Uh, all the other elements obviously are off diagonal. They are either diagonal or they're off diagonal. But when they are off diagonal, when mu is not equal to nu, it may be either a monatomic term, which is to say you've got two different functions on the same nucleus, or it could be a diatomic term, so that you have two functions on two different nuclei. Now, every Fox matrix element contains electron repulsion integrals, and I'd like to look at the electron repulsion integrals, that's these integrals first, and, and let me explain why. If you think about the bottleneck in this calculation, how many of these one electron integrals are there? Well, mu can take on capital N uh, values because there are N basis functions, and nu can take on capital N values, so there must be at least N squared of these integrals, and symmetry will get you a, a small reduction in that number, but in any case, roughly N squared. And nuclear attraction, same thing, N possibilities, N possibilities, that's N squared, and there's Z nuclei, but in any case, for each nucleus, sorry, there's K nuclei, but for each nucleus, there's N squared. But the two electron repulsion integrals, N possibilities for mu, N possibilities for nu, n possibilities for lambda, n possibilities for sigma. So that is n to the fourth of these integrals. And as a result, they are the bottleneck in the Hartree-Fock procedure because n to the fourth uh, scales so much more quickly than n squared. So with large basis sets, you are looking at computing a very large number of these integrals. And so the, the immediate way to speed things up and make progress and address the bottleneck is to think about 
simplifying the computation of these integrals. So let me start with one of the very earliest approaches to that, and this uh, model, this yes, model, uh, this semi-empirical model is called Complete Neglect of Differential Overlap, or CNDO. And so the CNDO approximation says, well, I'm going to take my generic electron repulsion integral, mu, nu, lambda, sigma, and I'm going to declare by fiat that it is equal to Kronecker delta mu nu, Kronecker delta lambda sigma. So what do those two Kronecker deltas do? It says if mu isn't equal to nu, it's zero. If lambda isn't equal to sigma, it's zero. So that made life really simple. I would be plugging in a lot of zeros. Now, in the event that these two Kronecker deltas do not annihilate things, that will imply that mu is equal to nu, so I've got mu mu, and it'll imply that lambda is equal to sigma, so I have lambda lambda. So what's left is for these surviving integrals to decide, how will I compute a mu mu lambda lambda interaction? And what you'll do in this particular semi-empirical model is you will just go to a table and look up a certain value gamma. And gamma will depend on the nuclei A and B on which mu and lambda reside. In the case where A is equal to B, that is, these two functions are on the same nucleus, then the value that's recorded in the table is going to be the ionization potential of the atom minus the electron affinity of the atom. And you would go look that up in some handbook of chemistry and physics, for instance, take the difference and record it. Chisel it in the stone tablet that defines your CNDO model. Now, if it's not obvious to you, why exactly would this be equal to the ionization potential less the electron affinity? There's actually a pretty easy way to see that. So imagine I have my, I've changed from A to M in this case, but I've got an atom. And I've got two of these atoms, each with one electron on it. So if I consider the process of taking the electron off one of the atoms and putting it onto the other, well, it's the ionization potential that's the energy to remove the electron. It is negative the electron affinity that is the, just by sign convention, so the electron affinity is positive when it's a favorable energy change to attach an electron. So negative the electron affinity to put the electron on the atom. And notice that on this side of this balanced equation, there is an extra electron-electron repulsion. And that's, that's what we're measuring here is an electron-electron repulsion between two electrons on the same atom. So I've created this extra repulsion, and that's the difference between the two sides. And what is it? It's IP minus EA. So it's just a pretty simple thermochemical way of thinking about how would, how would you get at measuring the interaction between two electrons on the same atom. Now, when they're on different atoms, you just have some sort of combining rule that's going to tell you about the, uh, the interaction. And let me think about the simplest case, which is A and B are very, very far apart. So then I'll take a number plus a different number. These are the diagonal terms, right? A and B. And I'll divide by, well, they're very far apart, so R is big. So 2 just drops out. It doesn't even seem to be there. And here's gamma AA plus gamma BB, so that'll cancel out. And I'll just get 1 over R. And in atomic units, that's what I should get for two electrons repelling one another at large distance. It's just Coulomb's law, 1 over R. On the other hand, think about the other limit. What if A is actually equal to B? Now, of course, normally I just go look it up in a table, but we ought to have a function that agrees with our, our protocol. So if A is equal to B, I'll get gamma A plus gamma BB. R is 0, so this term goes away. So I'll want to divide by 2 because I've added it together twice here, and I will get, sure enough, gamma AA because A is BB. So this functional form simply allows you to smoothly connect between the two limits you know you should get, which is either uh, just 1 when AB is equal to AA, or 1 over R at long distances. So it has all the right limits, and it's, it's not the only approach you might take to connect those limits, but it's the approach in CNDO. So notice how speedy I will have made this process, because I do not have to uh, compute n to the fourth integrals. 
I only actually have to compute a very, very small number. I'll let you jot down for yourself if you want to think about it, how many would you end up computing. And moreover, I'm not even computing. I'm not solving integrals over all space. I'm just looking up numbers and plugging in values. So this just runs like the wind, and that's particularly convenient. But what's a problem with CNDO? So that's something to think about. Uh, this is just a recap of exactly what I said on the last slide. But notice there's no distinction in two electron repulsions. That is, consider, consider the singlet and triplet states of methylene. And if I ask myself, how do the two electrons in the singlet state and the triplet state of methylene uh, differ in their interactions? Well, they don't differ at all. They're both on a carbon atom. And so I will go and I'll, I'll look at, let, let me call this the sp2 orbital. So I'll get the sp2 orbital interacting with the sp2 orbital, but that's just gamma carbon carbon. So I go look that up at some number. And here it's a p orbital and an sp2 orbital, but they're still both on carbon. So it's still gamma carbon carbon and same number. So that says that in CNDO, there is no singlet triplet splitting between the singlet and triplet state of methylene. They're exactly the same. All the, all the interactions are the same, so the energies are the same. Another good example would be think about rotation in hydrazine. So there's another nitrogen hiding behind here in this Fischer projection. So this is the molecule hydrazine, rocket fuel, a component of rocket fuel. And I have a gauche and I have an anti-orientation of hydrazine shown here. But a surviving integral in CNDO will be this lone pair interacting with this lone pair. And uh, because this is an orbital times itself and an orbital times itself. They're on different atoms. Of course, they're both a nitrogen, but they're not the same nitrogen. So I would take the formula I've erased from the last slide because it didn't fit, but you know it's gamma AA plus gamma BB, where both A and B are nitrogen, but it'll be over the distance between the two nitrogens times the two gamma values, two plus that value. Uh, in any case, given that the nitrogen atoms are the same distance apart, so the R doesn't change, I will get exactly the same interaction here as I would here because it's not the R between the lone pairs, which by the way would be a continuous R, you'd have to integrate that. It's the R between the nuclei on which the orbitals are. And if I don't change the distance between the two nitrogen atoms, I get exactly the same interaction. And clearly that's not uh, physically realistic. You get more interaction in the gauche than you do in the trans. So in uh, the next video, which will start with this slide, we will take a look at how you can improve on the CNDO approximation to put in more of this chemically realistic uh, types of interactions and distinguish between, say, rotomers or electronic states.